next presenter is Nick Skronsky. He's a research forester with the Northern Research Station in Morgantown, West Virginia. Nick began his career as a forester and prescribed fire manager at Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst in New Jersey. His current research focus is developing tools and techniques for more efficient implementation and monitoring of prescribed fire. Nick also leads the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange, which spans the northeastern U.S. and serves many state, local, and private land management entities by providing science communication services. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Skaronsky. I'm a research forester with the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station out of Morgantown, West Virginia. I'd like to start today by thanking James for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, workshop panel. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about how we might be able to use terrestrial laser scanning uh, to augment our monitoring techniques of three-dimensional forest structure and loading uh, with both prescribed fire and wildfire applications. Uh, I'm also going to give a brief example of some quick fire modeling that we did of an actual wildfire in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. So this talk today is sort of a conglomeration of several different studies and even an operational example of how we might use this technology moving forward. Uh, to help us quantify 3D fuel loads. And so I just wanted to start uh, by acknowledging some of the many collaborators that we have working on this project. I'm just a small, small piece of all of this. Uh, and it's really just been a great, uh, almost a grassroots effort and collaboration between the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and several other entities thus far. So I think this is a really cool infographic uh, that explains sort of the process of of a prescribed fire, like the life of a prescribed burn from a manager's perspective, the things that we do uh, in, in sort of a stepwise way. And I think it's a really good tool to show the general public and to show uh, folks aspiring to be burn managers and things of that nature. But I also have always sort of looked at it as a really cool way to segment our research. Uh, so what part of this do I think that we could help or where do I think that we need more emphasis and, and digging into and how can we do things a little bit better than what we're doing them right now? And so this talk today is mostly going to be focused on sort of that pre-burn planning stage. So how can we do a better job of understanding the status of the stand that we're selecting? Uh, when we have selected a stand, can we get a little bit better idea or a better picture of what the 3D structure of the fuels are, things of that nature? And then also looking then past the burn prep and executing the burn, looking at the monitoring part. You know, I'm the PI of the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange uh, as sort of a, a third or fourth job. And one of the things that we always get in our feedback from land managers is that they need to be doing more monitoring or that the tools that are available to do monitoring aren't really up to snuff with what they would like to have. And so that, and it really goes hand in hand with the evaluation step where we say, we take that step back and we look at the burn block and we sort of say, did we do what we set out to do here? Uh, and, and how does that look? What does that look like? And I think that this group of scientists that I, I showed in the previous slide were really kind of focused on giving a, a quantitative way to really show that we've hit those benchmarks, that we've, we've accomplished the things that we have set out to accomplish or that we haven't. And then we can sort of circle back around and see why that might have been. So something I don't want to do today is give the impression that there aren't plenty of ways out there to monitor the things that we're doing in the forest uh, before, after, uh, during prescribed fires. There's been a great deal of effort from several different agencies in developing different monitoring protocols and putting them in handbooks, and those materials are out and available for everyone to take advantage of and use. I'm not suggesting that the TLS methods that we're, we're showing today are like a holy grail or anything of that nature to replace these types of things. Uh, but I, I just want to show and, and give some perspective that we have thought about these things quite extensively as agencies and, and, and nonprofits and private land managers. Uh, I think that what we're presenting here today might just be a way to augment those uh, and to collect some data that we haven't really had the opportunity to collect before. So historically, we've kind of made use of the tools that are available to us, and we've used those as best we could. Um, to, to monitor fuels or to, you know, describe conditions before a fire or after a fire. And I think that, you know, we've been kind of limited to the things that we had in our hands. And, you know, in some cases, those were tape measures or photographs or our eyes. Uh, and that's how we 
what about monitoring fuels? And so we've had protocols develop, as I showed in the previous slide, that have been dependent on these sort of historic things that, that we've had access to. And I guess the, 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 maybe the main point of this talk isn't necessarily that the, the work that we're doing is, is awesome, which it is, but that's not the, the point. The point is that there are tools sort of coming online that are allowing us to estimate and measure things in ways that we haven't been able to do that in the past. And so here's an example of Brown's transects, you know, tried and true. Uh, we've all probably done them if you're watching this or on this talk. Um, you know, you've had some experience doing this. So it was probably a part of your, your, uh, your skills necessarily for your position in some cases. Uh, and I guess just looking at these photos, you know, it's really helpful for stuff on the forest floor. But I want to just sort of emphasize how it doesn't capture the other fire effects that we can see uh, in these photos. And that's really the change in the three-dimensional structure of the canopy uh, and the, the forest structure. And we know that's important for, for, for many different reasons, uh, ecologically, uh, sort of for fire behavior, for drag forces while the fire is burning through, for, for all kinds of things, nesting birds, all, all of those things. We know that 3D structure is important. And we really haven't been able to do a very good job actually describing the three-dimensional structure of a stand. Uh, and we certainly haven't been able to do it uh, to the level that a land manager might be able to go out and implement those types of measurements on their own uh, before and after a fire. So looking at that, the effect of that fire. And so that's really where we're, we're trying to go with this all today. So moving on from sort of the brute force small plot measurements or or monitoring techniques like the Browns transect. This is an example of a more recent development in how we're able to actually estimate changes in, uh, in canopies or forests following fire. Uh, this is an example of some uh, normalized burn ratio work or difference normalized burn ratio in this case, uh, looking at a prescribed fire and a bit of a wildfire in the New Jersey Pine Barrens from a couple of years ago. Um, so the images on the upper left are basically a before and after the fire. Uh, spectral reflectance bands sort of mixed together there to give us a false color, color composite. Uh, and we went out and did uh, some CBI plots within the spatial extent of those fires uh, and were able to estimate the, um, basically the severity of the fire by different strata and substrates in the canopy uh, on the forest floor and the mid-story. And we were able to link those through regression analysis to the changes that occurred within that series of images. And so we're able on the bottom right there to create basically a map of fire severity that showed us the spatial component in two dimensions of sort of how that fire affected these burn blocks. So a more recent and, and interesting way to look at things, but still sort of stuck in that uh, two dimensional plane. Uh, so how do we move from 2D to 3D? Uh, a lot of us are probably familiar with ALS or airborne laser scanning. Um, probably more traditionally now that's used, has been used to look at sort of digital elevation modeling and develop even object height modeling of the canopy. Uh, we've become a lot more interested in the clutter sort of between the top and the bottom of the laser returns. But uh, the, other, the other way that we can look at things now is through terrestrial laser scanning. And this isn't really a new, all that new technology, but it is new that it's now becoming much more affordable and much simpler to operate and to maintain these instruments. And so that instrument there uh, at the bottom is the BLK360. It's an example of a relatively inexpensive uh, laser scanner. And as you can see, it just has one button to push on it. So, uh, you know, as we were sort of developing some ideas a couple years ago, we thought, man, it would be really easy to put these in the hands of a land manager or a really relatively untrained forest technician, send them out to a stand, set a tripod up, push that button and come back with a um, basic three-dimensional representation of the structure of the canopy. Uh, and so that's what you can see there on the right-hand side. That's what that data looks like. So again, this is just an example of uh, what the BLK looks like set up and what the, the scan looks like. So we've, we've kind of come up with a bit of a methodology that's still sort of being refined, but it is published at this point. Um, and we've taken this approach of only using one scan, uh, basically making this a point-based um, sort of statistical sample um, of, of these three-dimensional properties rather than trying to create an actual model of the forest stand, like a physical model, where we would take like many stands or many scans, excuse me, uh, in the same area. 
this this allows us to, to grab samples from many more locations and to save time in processing uh, rather than trying to link and merge these scans together. So the challenge with this TLS data is so now we've gone out in the woods, we've collected data maybe before and after a fire at the same spot, or we've maybe inventoried like a whole uh, wildlife refuge, or we've done many plots across the national forest, and we have all these really large point clouds that have hundreds of thousands or millions of points in each one of them. And so I don't think that it would be very fair to expect our uh, fire manager or our, our te forest technician to go ahead and figure out a way to, uh, to process and understand all those data. So one of the things that we've been working on quite extensively is building an automated data flow where the field data could be collected, um, it could be uploaded to the cloud, uh, processed um, through various tree removal, metric generation, uh, going through sort of regression analysis, and then spitting back out like a number that matters, right? Like, so how many tons per acre uh, are there? Or, or what is the canopy cover at 10 meters above the ground as opposed to 15 meters above the ground? You know, sort of all of these types of, of new metrics that we might be able to describe canopy structure with uh, those have to be generated. And so this is an example of what that workflow looks like. And we're working to refine this process so that it's much easier for the end user to upload their data and get an answer back. So sort of following on from the slide earlier where we use spectral reflectance data to look at burn severity in two dimensions, uh, this is an example of a paper that Mike Gallagher wrote uh, last year that shows how we could use a single TLS scan to look at burn severity at the plot level. And again, this really comes in handy for a manager to be able to go into their burn unit, do a pre-scan and then a post-scan, and maybe they're not even interested in fuel load or forest structure, but more interested in looking at what effect they had on uh, severity at different levels in the canopy now. So not just in 2D, but in 3D. Uh, so that's what this example shows. So I showed uh, TLS data, and then I showed you earlier the ALS data. So this is an example of some ALS data. And one of the cool things that, that we can do here is that we can use the TLS, the, the plot-based TLS data. So if you went out and collected 20 or 30 plots, uh, we can kind of use that as like a 3D uh, verification or validation metric for a larger ALS acquisition. So now those sort of plot scale, uh, three-dimensional fuel attributes that we know about, we can actually use those to develop a regression model and model those same outputs across like an entire landscape and using uh, uh, airborne laser scanning. And that's really useful for some of the modeling applications here. We're, we're sort of, I'm slowly getting back around to modeling, uh, but to be able to use uh, terrestrial laser scanner to scan to airborne laser scanner and essentially develop the fuels inputs for uh, fire behavior models. Uh, and that's sort of where I'm going with this next. So sort of in the middle of the development of some of this work, there was a really fast moving fire uh, that happened in the in Jersey Pine Barrens. Uh, it was a single point ignition really fast moving, high intensity fire that left some awesome spatial patterning in the vegetation following the fire. Uh, and you can sort of see it on the right hand side here. Uh, that's looking backwards towards the origin of the fire. But in the foreground, you can kind of see those remnant trees. So the, the behavior of the fire sort of lent itself to creating these crown streets. Um, and at the time, we were sort of looking for a, almost a development project or a proof of concept kind of question or project to use uh, the, the quick fire model. And so we, we undertook an effort to try to reconstruct this fire using quick fire. So it just so happened that we had a relatively recent uh, airborne LIDAR acquisition that covered the extent of this fire before the fire happened. So uh, the top left panel there shows sort of where it happened in Jersey, where within the Pine Barrens it was. And then the right hand side shows the spatial extent of the fire, the fire perimeter, the final fire perimeter in red. And then we kind of zeroed in on a, a smaller domain just for sort of computational reasons and uh, even further zoomed in on the fire area at 50, till 53 minutes of, of when the fire had started. So from that pre-existing uh, airborne laser data set, we were able to develop canopy height model and also identify the location of, of, of taller pitch pines within that simulation domain. So on the left, we have just our sort of bare bones simulation using existing fire breaks, the existing fuels that we had parameterized uh, from the ALS data. And on the right hand side, you can kind of see from um, satellite imagery what that fire looked like, what the shape of the fire was. 
in the center there, we we did like a visual reconstruction using some some expert knowledge of folks that were there, where the fire was, and then we ran it, which is what's going on, on the left hand side there. We ran that model, and so you can see how the far right pane there compares to the visual estimate. So a pretty pretty good um, fit. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. Models aren't perfect, but they're useful, um, and so we were pretty confident that we had a pretty good representation of the fire. So I think the really interesting thing that we were able to do with this, and this gets back to the monitoring or even prescribed burn planning, was that we were able to create several different scenarios uh, where we were modifying either the surface fuels uh, or the presence of vegetation at different strata of the canopy um, or adding fire breaks or lengthening or, width or widening fire breaks rather. Uh, and then rerunning the model and basically coming up with ideas of how we were able to mitigate that fire. Like if we had undertaken a certain management activity, how would that have changed the outcome of, of the Spring Hill wildfire? And I think that that's, that's the type of planning tool that, that we really need in our toolbox when it goes for pre-fire planning. You know, how are we actually changing the landscape? What do we have to do uh, to meet some some mitigation goal? How do we decrease the rate of spread by a factor of, of two? Um, how, do we, uh, how do we widen a fuel break to, to minimize the risk of ember deposition on the other side starting spot fires? Those types of questions are, are really what we're trying to get at and get to and to make it available to land managers to be able to use these tools uh, to answer those questions about their actual burn blocks. So this slide is sort of an example of some of the output from these various scenarios that we ran using the, the model. Um, and looking at the graph at the bottom there, you can see how uh, the burned area, which is what we used as our sort of evaluating criteria in this case, uh, changed over a certain period of time. So after 3,500 seconds, you can see on the right-hand side of that graph the, the differences between the different scenarios. So uh, scenario, zero, which was the original scenario, is the top black line. And you can see there that scenario three uh, actually halved the burn area uh, that was simulated over that period of time. So we can really see the effects of the different mitigation activities that we, we took uh, using the model. So just as an example of how, how this type of modeling could be used to influence our, our decision making and our practices when we're implementing fuel reduction treatments. All right, that's all I have today. Um, I'd like to again thank James Furman for the opportunity to present to you all and for his facilitation of this. Um, and I'd, I'd again like to thank all of the collaborators that I listed uh, at the beginning of the talk and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and hey, if anybody has any questions or has any interest in exploring this a little bit further, I know this, this talk was sort of a little bit wide ranging, uh, but please feel free to reach out and contact me um, and I'd be, I'd be happy to chat. So again, thanks everybody. Thank you.